Hi, this is Dr. Gregory Sadler. I'm a professor of philosophy and the president and founder of an educational consulting company called Reason.io, where we put philosophy into practice. I've studied and taught philosophy for over 20 years, and I find that many people run into difficulties reading classic philosophical texts. Sometimes it's the way things are said or how the text is structured, but the concepts themselves are not always that complicated, and that's where I come in. To help students and lifelong learners, I've been producing longer lecture videos and posting them to YouTube. Many viewers say they find them useful. What you're currently watching is part of a new series of shorter videos, each of them focused on one core concept from an important philosophical text. I hope you find it useful as well. One of the very useful pieces of advice that Cicero provides us in his work on friendship is that we need to actually choose our friendships quite carefully. And that doesn't mean just at the very beginning of a friendship. That also means that we need to, every once in a while, reassess and think about, is this person genuinely a friend to me? Or should I, you might say, downgrade that relationship in, in some way, not view it as a genuine friendship? And this is where a lot of people get themselves into all sorts of problems and difficulties in their lives, particularly if, if we understand friendship as not just referring to what we typically call friendship, but also romantic relationships, or perhaps even like, you know, partnerships, or mentor-mentee relationships, all these sorts of things where we have some affection and goodwill and a kind of intimacy that allows us to make demands upon each other. If we've got the wrong sort of people in this relationship, <clears throat> then we're laying ourselves in for all sorts of problems. Even if we are good people, we are going to be stressed because of it. And the first bit of advice that he provides us with which is actually really great advice, is in chapter 20. It's not the first bit of advice, actually. It's, this is the first bit that I'm going to start with because it comes, uh, you might say, earlier in consideration of our life process. So he tells us that, as a rule, decisions about friendship should be formed after strength and stability have been reached in mind and age. So decisions, he's going to use this word eudicium and all sorts of cognates of it. For example, here he says that uh, omnino amicitiae eudicandae sunt. This is, this is a uh, gerund of construction, right? It's saying that decisions about or deciding about or that which is to be decided should happen under these conditions. And so what are the conditions? He says... Um, strength and stability, corroboratis yam confirmatis que uh, et ingenis et itibus, right? So ingenis is our, our mind, our mental capacities, which would include not just our reasoning capacities, but perhaps you might say, in, you know, education of the, the emotions and desires. And then he uses the word for life stages or age, right? So there's a lot of people that we call friends early on in our lives who maybe we shouldn't be calling friends later on in any full sense. He says that men who in boyhood were devoted to hunting and games of ball shouldn't keep as their intimates those who they loved at that period simply because they were fond of the same pursuits. Why not? Well, because your, your interests change. And just because somebody was a good companion in, you know, playing on the playground or maybe you went to camp together or, you know, you, you played games together online or that doesn't make them necessarily a good friend. You know, I, I think back to my childhood, I haven't thought about this for a very long time. I had a lot of friends with whom I, I not only played quite a few games and consumed media, but we even had like projects that we were going to do. I had, a, I had a friend in uh, fourth grade and we were going to make it big by designing missiles and we like made all sorts of blueprints. And then we were planning to live in Brazil, you know, and we were going to build this, this palatial place. You know, I haven't seen that guy for 
probably 45 years. No, not 45, but close to, close to 40 years. You know, and I haven't thought about him for perhaps 10 years or so. We shouldn't, we shouldn't just stick with childhood friendships because those are arbitrary, right? We want to pick our friends on a better basis. She's, and he goes on and says, I admit that these are not to be neglected, but they're to be regarded in an entirely different way. Difference of character is attended by difference of taste, and this diversity of taste severs friendships. And he says, nor is there any other cause why good men cannot be friends to wicked men or wicked men to good men, except that there is the greatest possible distance between them in character and in taste. So you may have a childhood friend who turns out to have been a good good person back then, but has gone downhill, and you, you really can't stay friends with that person. And this is something that is very difficult for many people. Cicero's advice to us, as he says uh, in, in chapter 21, do not love too quickly or love those who are unworthy of it. No indignus, right? People who don't actually deserve that affection. How do we know that that's the case? Well, he goes on and he says that what our procedure ought to be uh, he says there, there's only one security and one provision against the ills of having, you know, picked up uh, the wrong sort of friendship. That is neither to enlist your love too quickly nor to fix it on unworthy men. They are worthy of friendship who have within their own souls the reason for their being loved. So right off the bat, that tells us some things. You shouldn't be loving people because they invite you to the best parties. You shouldn't be loving people solely because they're you know, physically attractive. You shouldn't be loving people because they have a ton of money or a fast car or we could go down and you know, a whole list about this stuff. You shouldn't love somebody because they've, they're enjoying celebrity at this point in time. You should love them for what is within. And that takes a little bit more work to find out, doesn't it? He says that this is, you know, rather rare and the majority of human beings um, don't recognize anything as good unless it brings some profit. They regard their friends as they do cattle. You don't want to be friends with somebody like that. So, you know, his, his advice there is that we should love our friend after appraising them, uh, not the reverse. I'll actually just read this passage. And a praise here, again, is this word. Uh, he, he says, uh, you know, when, when you're judging them, right? He says, you should love your friend after you've, you've judged, after you've assayed, after you've checked them out. You should not appraise him after you've begun to, to love him. Why, why not? Well, because you're already biasing it and you, you're already in a little bit too deep. The time to figure out is before you start to feel all this affection, whether they're worthy of that affection or not. Um, and so when we do this, we exhibit a kind of carelessness that he talks about in chapter uh, 30, 23 says, carelessness is so great in regard to a relation, absolutely indispensable that it deserves the more to be censured. We should be saying, what are you thinking? What are you doing there? Censured also means criticized. He says the one thing in human experience about whose advantage all human beings with one voice agree is friendship. So why aren't we most careful with that? Well, because we allow our contingent experiences and affections to suck us in, and therefore we, we choose badly. Now, there is a difficulty here. How do we get to know what a person is really like? We can't just look at their profile from the outside, right? Imagine that we're talking about, oh, a great example of this. Think about dating, right? Everybody has dating profiles. And very often when people show up to have the date face to face, they say things like, wow, you don't look anything like your picture. And, you know, that's because people put forward a false front. They downplay their bad characteristics or they frame them in euphemistic ways, you know, Loves taking walks on the beach could be a euphemism for obsessively goes to the beach every single day. Right? Uh, and they upplay whatever positive characteristics they have. 
That is if they're the kind of person to do that. There are some people who are scrupulously honest in the dating game, um, but there's probably not that many of them, right? And so how do you get to know what a person is really like? Well, if you're dating, you have to go on actual dates with them. If you think about romantic relationships, you have to go to a variety of different sorts of situations and uh, activities and see whether the person who claims to love sporting events really does enjoy sporting events or the one who really says they love walks on the beach is not just trying to, you know, be romantic and put ideas in your head, but genuinely enjoys that. Um, You also have to see whether you're compatible with each other, whether you can stand to be in the same room with each other long term. And then, of course, if it becomes sexual, you have to figure out a whole variety of things like, you know, are you are you good with what they do and are they good with what you do and desire? And, you know, are you cool with each other's histories or is that going to be an impediment? All of these things take a while to to learn, don't they? So Cicero says that we, we do have to make tests of people. He says that at the same time, it's very hard to come to a decision without a trial while such trial can only be made in actual friendship. So we have a little bit of paradox here. Friendship outruns the judgment and takes away the opportunity of the trial. So he says it's the part of wisdom or prudence that it checks the headlong rush of goodwill as we would that of a chariot, put the brakes on, right? And thereby so manage friendship that we may in some degree Put the dispositions of friends as we do of those of horses to a preliminary test. How do we do this? He gives you some good examples. Some men often give proof in a petty money transaction how unstable they are, how unreliable they are. While others who could not have been influenced by a trivial sum are discovered in one that is large. If there are any who who think it base to prefer money to friendship, where shall we find those who do not put office, civil and military rank, high place and power above friendship, so that when the former advantages are placed before them on one side and the latter friendship on the other side, they will not much prefer the former. And so there's a lot of people who, when when the chips are down, as we say, they're going to fail. So we should make tests of them in order to see whether they are really good friends or not. And this, this is a, a real issue. What are the characteristics of a genuine true friend? One of the things that Cicero has, has discussed considerably, and here's the question of whether we should do wrong things if a friend asks us to do them. And a good friend is not going to do that because a good friend is going to be a good person who won't ask us to compromise ourselves in that sort of way. But he also identifies several other characteristics of the person that we want to be in, in a friendship with. And notice these are all internal to the person. These are character traits, right? So he tells us that um, you know one, one set of things that we want from a person is what, that they are what he calls firm, steadfast, and constant. And this is, this is quite important, right? Um, what would be the opposite of this? Being unreliable, changing, um, the kind of person who you can't depend upon. And <clears throat> so that's, that's one important aspect of it. Another way of translating some of this is that they are themselves loyal as, as well. You can rely upon them. Um, he then also tells us in chapter 18 that the right course is to choose for a friend one who is frank, praetera, uh, sociable, communem, and sympathetic, consentianum. Um, so what does being frank and sociable and sympathetic means? It means that they reach out to us. They, they are connected with us. They'll also tell us when we're screwing up. They're not going to hide things from us. They're going to be sincere, we might say, or in in the Latin, you know, honestum, honestus in this case, because we're talking about uh, these friends. And that means, you know, sort of a straight shooter, as we say. So these are characteristics that we want in a friend. How do we find out whether they actually have them? 
we do have to put them to the test. So what we have here being advised by Cicero, in addition to the, hey, the contingent things of childhood, uh, you know, be very careful with them or, you know, the workplace or whatever else it happens to be. We also have this emphasis on, you know, you've got to, te- you've got to try out some things and see how they deal with things in a situation. And then you trust and love a bit more. And then you try something more. And genuine friends are going to pass every test. Some people might actually say, well, you know, it's not really a real friendship. It's not good if you're putting your friend to the test. Cicero would actually disagree and say, a real friend would have no problem being put to the test because they're going to realize that this is a way for them to actually succeed. They, they show you that they're a good friend. Whereas somebody who's a little bit sketchy, somebody who is a bit more unreliable would probably get defensive about being put to the test in part because they're in, in, insecure and insincere when it comes to their own friendship. So uh, very important to choose our friends carefully, according to Cicero. Uh, 